we got WGR 550's Nate Geary on with us tonight. Welcome to the pod. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I was going to mention it to you if you didn't say something. That was the uh, the intro video there is uh, it's a little old, I guess now, huh? It's not, it hasn't been updated uh, recently, it looks like. <clears throat> yeah, no, um, you're, you're right, bro. I mean, we're, uh, <laughs> we're almost one week into a post Stefan Diggs Bills yeah. like, saga here, and uh, we got to we got to fix that. We got to fix that. That starts. That's Josh that's Allen hurdle will do. But yeah, we'll just put Josh Allen. Anything Josh Allen on there, Phil, will probably. But... No, yeah, no. anything Josh Allen uh, or you know, listen. I mean, Matt Milano. I feel like is is kind of like a new face, you know, and Ooh. like. I, I, it, listen, as a content creator, maybe starting off with like Matt Milano cutting Mike White in half feels like probably a good start. Yeah. All right. That's right. That's fair. We can definitely respect <laughs> um, I mean, we, we all we all follow you on Twitter. We all absolutely love your tweets. Um, Thanks, we man. Gotta ask, well, I got to ask first and foremost. I think all of Bill's Moffitt, for the most part, was kind of shocked about what happened last Wednesday. Just walk me through your initial thoughts. And what you kind of thought one Bills drive trading Stephon Diggs away. Yeah, uh, I wrote a piece about it. Um, I was actually at work by my full time job and uh, was right about to walk into a meeting. And, uh, you know, we've got people from out of town and some, you know, guys that live in Florida, but are Bills fans that are in town. Um, and immediately, I'm, you know, I got Twitter up on my desktop. I got two screens, so I'm still productive. Don't worry. Um, and the first Adam Schefter tweet pops up, you know, like, you know, breaking. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. Like, I, I, like I'm not going to get fake Schefter. Like, it's not going to happen. I, I, I didn't even really take it seriously. Um, so I'm, you know, down. I'm like trying to type an email so that I can walk into this meeting. And then the... Next, then the Rappaport tweet, then the, you know, field. Yeah. And then just like all of my, you know, notifications of people that like I follow over and get live updates for that are in the national media are all popping up at the same time. So my initial reaction was, holy shit, the Bills just traded Stefan Diggs. And so I'm across from the, from the conference room and I'm like, guys, guys, the Bills just traded Stefan Diggs. And the looks that I got were like, okay, all right, Gary. Yeah, sure. All right, man. You know, cool. Um, I'm like, I am, I'm dead serious. This is a very, it was just in the moment, very surreal. I, I wrote about how it reminded me a lot about, uh, or uh, reminded me a lot of when the bills, uh, traded for LaShawn McCoy, uh, in a different way, obviously it wasn't as much excitement as it was shock, but, uh, I was in, uh, like a com 300 class at Buff State. Uh, I was at the time just interning for, for WGR. So I wasn't like working there, working there. Um, and I remember, you know, you know, sneaking a peek at my Twitter cause I'm in a com 300 class and wanted to shoot my head off. Sorry, Bruce Bursky. Um, and uh, I just remember like kind of looking around, like, is, does anyone else know that the bills just got LaShawn McCoy? I had to like, you know, walk out of the room and recollect my thoughts and do a quick, you know, fist pump, air bump. Um, it reminded me a lot of that just because of the shocking nature of it. I, I think that for the better part of what, I don't know, um, a year, a, ca a full calendar year, um, there had been these rumors, but they weren't really rumors. Like it's hard to call them rumors. It was just people saying that the bills should, or that they will trade Stefan Diggs. It wasn't from people that were actually in the know. It was, you know, fans tweeting, uh, you know, fan sided, uh, bleacher report, you know, just these like, rile up bills fans type of uh tweets and for it to actually happen um i think brought into perspective just how you know maybe disconnected at times we are with this particular organization and not in necessarily a bad way it's just how in-house they can tend to keep their information and, and keep the things that are going on and if you remember the, you know, Russ Brandon and, and Doug Whaley uh, eras, um, that was not the same experience. Things like this would have gotten out well before uh, a trade happened. And um, other than Antonio Brown tweeting it out, whatever, like 10 days before the trade actually went down. Um, I don't know that a lot of people really saw this coming. So absolutely big shock. Um, but after the dust settled, um you know, it's hard for me to say I get it uh, just from the salary cap implications. Um, 
but it's certainly, I think Brandon Bean said it best. I mean, they're not better today than they were um, a couple of days ago before the trade, but you know, let's maybe wait till September. I think a lot of people around the league uh, buried the bills last year um, and left them for dead after that, that Denver game and maybe rightfully so. Um, and they were able to respond and come back. So I, I, I'm, I won't leave a Josh Allen, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean team left for dead. Uh, but uh, it's certainly leaving more questions than we have answers at the moment. 100% agree. 100% agree. Um, and, and just to your point about like the cap ramifications, dude, like that, that was my thought. Like, I, like you hear it, like you see, like, I feel like, before before Wednesday, you hear like other other fan bases saying like, oh, you can just tell Stefan's not happy. He wants out. He wants out. You see the tweets. Like you see Stefan even the night before on Tuesday, where somebody tweeted out about Josh's success and what Stefan meant to Josh's career and all this. And what is Stefan? He fired back a tweet and he was like, Oh, like you think so? Like you, you sure? You sure? And and I saw that and I was like, Oh, okay. So he's taking a shot at the quarterback. But you know, I looked at my girlfriend on Tuesday night and I told her, I was like, you know what? I'm I'm muting this guy. I'm muting Stephon Diggs until the regular season because I don't want to put up with it. And then 24 hours later, not even not even 11 hours later, he's traded. But, um, yeah, no, I completely agree. Definitely shocking. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Now, after the, the post digs, you got guys going around like T. Higgins, Brandon Ayuk, now C.D. Lamb is threatening to hold out. So when it comes to the draft, I want to know, are you a team trade-up guy? to get one of those higher wide receivers in the draft? Or would you take a risk and go after and be co competitive to go guys like Ayuk or T. Higgins? Um, it's a good question. I, I think there's layers to that conversation, right? I think there's pros and cons um, to each. I'm more and more as we get closer and closer to the draft, I think I'm finding myself in the um, – sort of in the grouping of maybe you just stay put and, and, and let the board fall the way that it does. And um, you end up with uh, Xavier Leggett or a Keon Coleman or an Adonai Mitchell. Um, and then you follow that up with another wide receiver in the second round. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention Lad McConkey in that first group, but that's a guy that I really like um, a lot. And, you know, I know not everyone's super in love with the idea of standing, you know, standing, Oh no. Oh no. Well, might have lost Nate here. It would have been my question. Well, oh, he's back. Oh, we're good. Oh, no, he, he lost him again. This happens. It's okay. My hair. Okay. Uh, uh, boom. Okay, my hair. Am I here? Am I here? Sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. 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 Um, last question really got to him. Okay. Yeah, right. No, uh, no, sorry. I was getting a call. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I think I found myself in the group of people that, um, standing pat and keeping your picks, um, for a team that I do think has some holes that they could backfill with some younger players, um, makes a lot of sense. But listen, I mean, if, to me, if, if you're talking about a trade up, I, I'm not really interested in the trade up to like 16, uh, or, you know, I've seen some stuff, you know, moving up to where the Raiders are at 13. I'm, this is not a shot at Brian Thomas Jr. There's a good chance he's going to be a great pro. Um, that's not the guy that I'm going to trade up for, in my opinion. Um, if he, you know, falls to 22, 23, um, and the Bills can do it with a fifth and a, you know, a second next year, um, sure. Like I can, I, I, I can, I can, I guess, live with that. But if they're going to make a move up the board, um, in my opinion, they should do it for a Malik Neighbors. They should do it for a Roma Dunze. Um, make the splash. If you're going to make a trade up, do do it all in with that in mind. You know what I mean? So that's my opinion on if you're going to trade up, do it. And then as for the, you know, trading for a veteran, you know. Do what I hate them going after Ayuk, uh, T. Higgins. Listen, the idea of C.D. Lamb would. I, I think he's you know maybe one of the more underrated receivers um, in the league. And you know, oh my God, the the Cowboys are just so such a poorly run uh, franchise. I mean, they for them to not be able to or to have not already signed C.D. Lamb um, and have this impending Dak Prescott contract looming over them um, and have signed one player. Um, it's, that's just it. Any other franchise you would have fired your general manager years ago. Um, probably after getting a sixth for Amari Cooper, but I think ultimately, you know, it's Steven Davis. It's, you know, it's right. the son of the son of the owner. Um, so, 
um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's that that is what it is. But I, I think for me, the idea of a trade and bringing in a 25, a 26 year old um, and had then having to pay him $30 million or in that neighborhood. I don't necessarily think it finds you in the same place you had been with Diggs, but I do really like the idea of having a rookie and, and having that rookie contract and giving you someone you feel like might be on the same level as one of these guys in a year or two. Um, but then also having the flexibility of that fifth year option and, um, and then being able to, to fill some other holes in your roster uh, makes a lot of sense to me. But I, I think for the people that are like, they, you've got to trade up, you've got to try to go get the best receiver possible. I, I just will point you to what the Green Bay Packers have done, and they surrounded their young quarterback in a pivotal year for him, by the way. Um, they were this That was a make or break. You're our franchise quarterback or you're a street free agent. That, um, and to do what he was able to do, um, you know, with that group of receivers and tight ends, um, why can't Josh Allen do that? Exactly. Absolutely. You don't know, got All right. Now I, got got some, turn, yeah. I got something. I got something, Shoot. Hey. Mr. Nate Geary, thank you first and foremost for coming on here. I follow man, I've been following you for a while. Me and Chris were just saying you are probably the most unhinged tweeter. Oh yeah, we love it. I yeah. I love it. But you can ask these fellas here, man, probably what two months ago I was saying I we gotta trade up for Brian Thomas Jr. That's all I would say. After the Dicks news, I'm kind of uh I think I'm on team trade out. I think. I think I I personally, like you mentioned, I'm in love with Lad. I think we're all in love with Lad yeah, McConkey. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually wanted to ask you how you think Curtis Samuel and Shakir are going to play together. Kind of like uh, we know what Curtis Samuel can do, but we also see what Shakir can do in a, in a bigger role. I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on how they're going to play well together with Joe Brady. Listen, I, I don't disagree with you, by the way. As the as your as your number two to Stephon Diggs as the X, yeah. I mean, I, I think I might be with you that 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 makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. uh, because in year one you're not expecting him to be your number one receiver. Not that I think necessarily you have to rely on whoever you draft at twenty eight or move up, move back has to be, um, you know, your number one receiver or whatever that actually means. But your question as it uh, pertains to you know, Curtis Samuel and uh, Kula Shakir. Yeah, I, I, I think you're asking probably the wrong question. I think the right question is, yeah, those guys and what they look like together. But I think the right question is, is Dalton Kincaid going to be the number one target in this offense this year? And 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 I think that's probably right. Um, and then how you splice in um, the separating ability. I, I, it's, I, I noted this in my piece um, last week after the Diggs move, which was this – team the organization has kind of gone through these phases with the types of weapons that they surround josh allen with if you remember his rookie year you've got andre holmes you've got kelvin benjamin um you've got these big catch point guys that can't separate um and then they were like nah we don't want this we want separators we want uh guys that are good against man coverage small speed but are route runners and can separate and then they go john brown and cole beasley and then they add stefan diggs and now I think we're on the third phase or the, you know, whatever you want to call it of the, this, where I think we're starting to see that as much as over the last couple of years, um, the Brian Dable and then the Ken Dorsey fingerprint on what type of players um, this team is going after at the, the playmaking positions, you're starting to see what Joe Brady, um, you know, really values, which I think is separation in yards after catch. Um, so with that said, you're talking about two guys. And right now, I, I think, you know, dating back to the second half of last year, where frankly, Khalil Shakir was outperforming Stefan Diggs and a lot of those metrics, the separation metrics, um, the, you know, catch efficiency metrics. Um, and, and I think with Curtis Samuel, you've got some real untapped potential with Curtis Samuel. I think he played in an offense where he was the number three receiver, um, behind, you know, two very good wide receivers, John, John Dotson and, um, obviously Terry McLaurin and, um, and an offense that didn't wasn't particularly good last year or the year prior. Um, and, you know, you talk about Curtis Samuel's best year was under Joe Brady. So I think that this is going to be a little bit of what we saw the Chiefs evolve into last year and how they've evolved since they traded Tyreek Hill, which is, you know, which is why I'm not totally convinced the Bills feel like they've got to move up as far as possible, get the number one, number two receiver in this draft is 
you know, I mentioned the the Green Bay Packers, but also the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, MBS and um, drafting Sky Moore, which has not worked out and trading for uh, Kadarius Tony, which has not worked out. But then, you know, Rasheed Rice and uh, they've made some moves, but they're 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 taking lottery tickets um, and they're plugging in and saying we have one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Um, we've got a great tight end. I think that's what the Bills are probably thinking and saying to themselves. Whether they think he's tra- you know Travis Kelsey is maybe another conversation, but um, I, I think that that is maybe the route here. And and you know with those two separators, go find yourself another really good separator. Again, that's why I think Lad McConkey. Um, does make a lot of sense. And with those three, let's just say it's McConkey, um, you know, Shakir and Samuel going into week one. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of position flexibility. There's got all three of those guys can play in the slot. Um, I know for sure that Curtis Samuel, a lot of people think he's a slot guy, but he's a guy that can play on the outside. Um, and McConkey to me is a guy that can play on the boundary. Um, and then you go get a big axe in the second round. You go get a Leggett, you go get a, um, you know, if Keon Coleman's there, someone like that, where you've got more of a big body, but athleticism as well, uh, it's hard. It would be hard for me to to you know poo poo that and, and say that, that that wasn't a good move for the Bills. I think that'd be a young, very young, um, but very interesting and and movable uh, group of receivers that that can really kind of play inside and outside. And um, if the offense is going to move through the tight end, which it does feel, and the run game, by the way, I, I do think that they're going to run the football more, which. Also, don't sleep on the Bills taking a running back in the second or third round either, because I do think that that's that they're going to want to find a um, a guy that can complement uh, James Cook. But they tend to keep drafting guys in the second and third round. No one has spent more day two um, uh, assets on running backs than Brandon Bean and, since he became the Bills general manager. So uh, they might be looking for the the next guy, but also the guy that complements the guy they have right now. I like that. I like that. Like. That's a good point because, I mean, I thought about running back, too, and, and I mean, you really look back. I mean, you think Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, James Cook, and here we are rumored again to take a running back potentially in, in the second day of the draft. That'll be interesting to see. Um, question for you as far as, like, so I saw I saw your, your tweet, like, um, that, that mock draft where the wide receivers fell off, I think, just like crazy. It was, I, think it, I think you tweeted about it today, and uh, they had us taking A.D. Mitchell. Um, I know we kind of already you, – you might have kind of asked this. Say, like, I know you, you alluded to Ladd McConkey, but what wide receiver are you all in on in terms of the draft? Like, as far as, like, your – Bill's got to go grab him. Like, got to grab him. Um, listen, I really like Roman Dunze a lot. I think if, like, that's a guy you want to go get, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. But to me – I think in a lot of years, uh, Malik Neighbors is the number one wide receiver in a draft. Um, and I, like to me, that's the guy that I look at and think, man, if you could walk away and walk out of uh, the draft in three weeks with Malik Neighbors as your number one, um, I, I I think that's a home run. And, and what you have to give up, obviously, you know, plays a part in this whole conversation is what what is it going to cost to get up? If, if you're going to do the Julio Jones trade, um, I am – all in on a guy like Malik Neighbors, um, so that that's been kind of my my draft crush um, for the better part of a little while here. Um, but Roma Dunze is not far off to me. I, I, he is also a, a guy that, in a lot of other years, might be the number one wide receiver taken um, in the draft. But you know, I, I don't I don't think I don't know what to make of uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I just he hasn't tested, and um, I think that he didn't really get to play with good quarterbacks. Um, at Ohio State, other than, you know, when he did get to play with C.J. Stroud. But last year, uh, Kyle McCord, you know, wasn't really that. And, you know, he's, he kind of had some injuries. And um, I think he's the number one receiver coming off the board. But I think in a lot of years, Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze are two guys that could easily do that as well. So um, either one of those two, um, to me, would be absolute home runs, go get them and, and you know, benefit type of guys. Um, but the one guy too, that I'm, I'm starting to like more and more, um, is Roman Wilson. Um, is this another guy from Michigan? Um, not the biggest guy in the world, but someone, um, that I think is probably going to be available for you day two. Um, you know, I, I would be very surprised if the bills don't pick in the third round. I know they currently don't have a pick. Uh, it would be very surprising for me, um, for the bills to, if, especially if they stay put at 28 for them not to maneuver around and get themselves um, a third round pick. I think they're also pretty salty about getting boned on the, uh, on the compensatory pick as well. 100%. Um, I'm going to flip things real quick. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let you go here in a second. I just want to ask. 
Um, I want to flip things to the other side of the ball. Um, obviously, we beefed up the interior defensive line. I mean, it's. I mean, we've what resigned Daquan Jones. We signed uh, was Austin Johnson. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've clearly beefed up the interior defensive line. Still leave some question marks here on the outside as far as the defensive ends. Um, obviously, they bring back AJ. You have Greg Rousseau, who seems to come on in the beginning of the season. Like he seems like he has a really solid beginning of the season, but kind of falls off towards the end of the season. But then you also got Von Miller, who we all. I mean, I don't need to. I don't need to explain anything about Von Miller this past season. But in terms of what are I guess our edge rushers look, and I guess kind of what our interior defensive line looks. What do you feel about the defensive line? Do you think maybe that's something that gets addressed at 28? Um, if, like, a Chop Robinson's there or something, like, what are your thoughts on the defensive line where we stand right now? I would not sleep on that being the pick at 28 if they just feel like he's the best player available and um, they've got a significantly higher grade on him than, say, like, you know, Lad McConkie or whatever uh, receivers left there. Um, at 20th overall. So that would not surprise me um, at all. So I think for me, where I come down on this is I, I think it's a pretty, I, I know not everybody loved, um, you know, Leonard Floyd and, you know, he kind of went silent in the playoffs, but I thought he had a really consistent year um, throughout. And I, I think they're going to miss his presence. Um, I, I think I saw, I forget who, who it was that tweeted about this today, but um, for people that think the Bills offseason ends when the draft ends, I think is um, not taking into account the flexibility they're going to be getting on June 1st when, um, you know, when they get $10 million from that, uh, from the release of Trey White. And, and you know, a Leonard Floyd-like move could absolutely happen um, in early June. And, you know, there are, you know, uh, Yannick Ndakwe is, is a name that is a veteran that puts up eight sacks a year that they could potentially go out and, Add to that defensive end room. That would not shock me um, at all. I, I think I like what they've done with the interior part of their defensive line. Um, added a couple of guys on one-year deals, um, get, getting Daquan Jones back. But that's a low-key um, you know, position of need for them that they need to address. I, I would not shock – I know a lot of people are like, hey, if you stay at 28, go back-to-back -back receivers. Um, but, again, I, I think this team has a whole stuff. I also think corner and safety are – you know, and I talked about uh, in my tweet was – you know, Cooper DeJean, if, if that's a guy um, to me, and, and this is not a knock on uh, A.D. Mitchell, I, I'm just not a huge fan of the prospect. Um, I think he's a very raw receiver. I, I think that both Texas guys um, are not particularly physical. They're not blockers. Um, some of the knocks and red flags on A.D. Mitchell are, you know, not finishing routes and um, some practice habits. And, it, I mean, if you've been around the organization, those – are typically red flags that this, you know, that Brandon Bean and, and Sean McDermott tend to stay away from. Um, so I think for me, it comes down to, you know, what do you think you've got a bigger hole in? I think that they feel better about their wide receiver room with, um, you know, with um, with Shakir and, um, uh, and, and, and Samuels than I think a lot of other people do. I, I'm sure that they know they've got holes to fill, but I could also easily see them, you know, wait until the second round, getting Xavier Gallat, something like that, or Legat, I should say, and then, going to sign, you know, I don't know, Tyler Boyd or, um, you know, Odell Beckham Jr. to a one-year deal um, and and maybe punting on that. And they've got two first round, two second round picks next year. Um, so that, that to me is why it's like, I, I know people really want to trade up and get super aggressive, but I think defensive end and defensive tackle along with corner uh, are two areas that they also need to address in the draft. And, and if you're moving all of your picks, um, it makes it harder uh, to, to upgrade those positions. Uh, and, and, I, and I do think there are positions in need. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you touched on the D line, Chris. I want to touch on the O line. A move that not everyone's talking about: Lyle Collins, one year, mm -hmm. six mil. In my opinion, that's starter money. We're bringing competition for Spencer Brown in his contract year. What are your What are your thoughts on that? So I actually think that's more competition for David Edwards at left guard. Um, I, I think, you know, he's, I think he started two seasons at left guard uh, for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, I think you're, you saw a little glimpse into the type of guards um, that, you know, they value and what they're going to try to do in the run game. And I think Lael Collins at left guard uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I don't necessarily, I, I don't view him as like this, you know, higher level competition or starter money um, for Spencer Brown. I, I, I do think though that you've got an open competition at left guard uh, between David Andrew, uh, David Edwards um, and Lael Collins. 
And those are both big bodied uh, downhill run blockers and Osiris Torrance um, also kind of that bigger body downhill, um, uh, you know, physical, great hands. Those are the types of guards um, and moving, you know, Connor McGovern to center. Um, you know, I, I don't, I guess I didn't really see that coming when they had signed him. I thought he's your left guard for the next, however long he's under contract. Um, but I think that they want to get a little bit more physical in between the tackles. And I think by bringing a Lael Collins in there, you, you could really see them getting more physical up front um, and, and getting some more of those um, inside runs. That's why it's like, to me, uh, I like Ty Johnson a lot. Actually, I, I probably like him a, a lot more than other people do. Um, but I don't think he's your RB2. I think his role last year in the RB3 role made a lot of sense. I think that they need to find a legitimate, um, you know, replacement for the carries that we saw from Latavius Murray last year. Um, and if you can get more physical in the middle, um, a, a more physical downhill running back uh, in the middle, um, I think opens up their run game a little bit more. So, um, yeah, I, my, my take on Lael Collins is is he's – you might even be able to pencil him in as your starter um, on week one uh, at the left guard position. All right, so we're talking a little bit about running back. I, I'm a little biased. Me and uh, Chris over here were talking about it the other week. Uh, what about a guy like Audric Estime? Does that kind of fit the bill for you, or are you thinking kind of a, a higher tier running back for this year's draft? You guys trying to get me to – Get weird on the podcast here you know i'm a notre dame fan i mean that's so am uh, i big big irish fan uh yes, big fan of uh of audric estimates uh i think a really unique combination of finesse and power um i know the the 40 numbers um were a little disappointing for him but he plays faster mm -hmm. Um, than those numbers uh, suggest on on film and and if you watch which i mean i've watched every snap of his over the course of his career um you know, when, when that guy gets downhill, um, the athleticism, the ability to leap over defenders. Um, and, and I think for, for how big he is, it's, it's sometimes surprising how much finesse, um, and patience he runs with. Um, yeah, I mean, that'd be a, if, if that's a guy available for you in the fourth round, um, I'd be all over that as a great compliment, um, to J, uh, to James Cook. So, yeah, I mean that, that, that to me, if you're going to go after a running back, fourth round, fifth round, and, and a guy like that's still available for you. And, and maybe those testing numbers push him down the running back chart a little bit. It's hard. It's really, really hard to deny, um, you know, his production at the college level. I mean, 18 touchdowns last year, um, averaged over four, uh, over five yards of carry, um, and was really a lot of, if not that whole Notre Dame offense last year. Of course, he's played behind a lot of great offensive lines. It's what Notre Dame does. Um, but I, I, I'm actually a little biased in that. I wish he would have went, went back last year or, or this year for another season. Um, just because I'm excited about what Notre Dame's got on the offensive side of the ball, a young offensive line, but, um, a lot of pretty fucking exciting weapons, uh, at the wide receiver position and tight end position that if you've been an Notre Dame fan, they have not recruited the wide receiver position particularly well over the last decade. So, um, yeah, don't get me going down the Notre Dame rabbit hole because I, I, I certainly will. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely team estimate for sure. I like it. Thank you. I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I already convinced was, myself he's a Bills. So yeah, we spent love that. We spent uh, some time, some we time. Did. You you talked me into it, and I I was in on it. Um, I'm gonna flip some something over real quick. We're gonna get away from from the Bills. Uh, quick question, because we're the Bills of Holler Pod. We try to, you know, we try to break down logistics of football, but we also like to look at it from a fan perspective. And what's the biggest thing in Buffalo? We always ask the guys when we have them on podcast when we have a guest on the podcast. You're, you're local here. I need to know your top three wing spots uh, in Buffalo. Top three wing spots. This is a loaded question. Uh, I tend to categorize them two separate ways. Uh, I've got uh, bar wings and I've got pizzeria wings. So I'm going to rank these by bar wings. Um, but I will tell you that I think from a pizzeria wing perspective, it's hard to beat Macy's Place Pizza. Um, their wings are their wings compete with any bar wing you have. But you got to realize that when you're eating, you know, pizzeria wings, you're putting them in a plastic case and you're bringing them home, and they're hard to judge the same way they are when you're getting them piping hot fresh at a restaurant. So. Um, I will tell you that this might be controversial. Uh, no, maybe it's controversial. I think the best wing in Buffalo is 9-11 Tavern in South Buffalo. Um, and I actually think it's by a pre 
particularly large margin. Um, their medium, their hot is, I mean, the cook on those things. Now, listen, you go to 9-11, you might not sit down for an hour uh, and it might take you another hour to get your food. Um, but if you've got time and you're good with drinking, you know, four five, six blue lights before you get your wings, uh, which I've got no problem with doing, um, that to me is the creme de la creme best wing in Buffalo um, and just about every factor of a wing. Second, uh, I'm going to give it to my my guys over here. Uh, I live very close by to Adolph's First Ward, uh, which is kind of a hole in the wall. If you haven't been there, you should go there type of place. Um, their medium, uh, their hot lately has been insanely hot, just a little too hot for me. Uh, their medium lemon pepper wing is one of my absolute favorites uh, in Buffalo. And then uh, I will go with uh, Barbell South as my uh, third favorite wing in Buffalo. Um, there are definitely a lot of other great contenders there. I, another one that I live very close to is Beltline uh, Brewery here um, in South Buffalo. And not a lot of people know about uh, how good their wings are, but Wednesday wing night, 28 bucks for 20 wings and uh, two draft beers. Hard to beat that deal. I do that quite a bit. Um, and I'm trying to think of another good honorable mention for you guys here. Um, Gene McCarthy is also really low key. Um, I'm, I got I, from the sounds of it, you guys can tell I, I like my South Buffalo. Uh, I've got a lot of family South Buffalo roots, so uh, I spend a lot of time and I live in you know the first ward. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, but again, nine eleven. If you haven't gone, that is that is as good of a wing as you're going to have in the entire world. Like seriously, okay. it's that good. Hey, what, what about what about I don't know if I don't know if you've ventured up towards UB North and. Uh... How about Elmo's? Ever have Elmo's? Elmo's, yeah, that would definitely be another uh, honorable mention. It's funny, I um, a couple of years ago now, it have been two years ago in the spring, uh, I actually took Alton Brown from Food Network out on a little wing tour. Uh, and Elmo's uh, with Andrew Galerno, who used to formerly the Buffalo News, has his own uh, food blog. Um, Andrew picked Lenovo and, uh, and Duff's, which, you know, I was like, listen, food blog guy, I don't know, but – uh <laughs> Lenovo ended up being uh Alton's favorite wing. Uh but again, pizzeria wing, we got to eat them there and you know, didn't have to take them home, so that was I'm sure pretty helpful in the conversation. Um but Elmo's is the, you know, honey mustard uh, Cajun honey mustard double dip is um uh, a very 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 good wing and in its own right. I, I I tend to judge places like I like to do a baseline, which is like I will go 20 places and try 20 medium wings because um, that is how I can judge you because everybody should be making their medium wing is pretty close, um, you know, to the, to the same. Um, but I also, I guess I should mention that I also really like wing nuts a lot. Okay, um, oh, I'm dying to go. You, I, I have not been to the new location in Amherst. Uh, their froth, the location inside froth brewing, um, Man, boys, those are money. Um, and they're, I think it's their mild. It's the, uh, the, the wing nuts mild sauce is one of the best flavored wings I've ever had. Um, it, it, they're medium and the hot get like a little weird for me. There's a lot of like weird spices in there. Um, it's not that they're too spicy for me. It's just that the mild is such a great flavor. But the honey garlic uh, – also, right up there with one of the best sauces I've had. And their wing is, I don't know, they're like dinosaur wings, to be honest with you. They're insanely large. Uh, but the crisp on those bad boys, yeah, they batter them a little bit or whatever, put some flour on it. It's not totally traditional buffalo. But um, those are definitely on the honorable list for me too.